We are in Matthew chapter 7, and I'm going to begin today with just reading verses 7 through 11 here in Matthew chapter 7, and um, we will get through verse 8 today, um, and that's good. There's a reason you guys are going to, you'll get it as we go, but um, we're going to look at 7 and 8, but I'm going to read 7 through 11 um, because that's what we'll be looking at over the next couple of weeks. So Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 through 11. Jesus says this in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asked him for bread, would give him a stone? Or if he asked for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to good, get good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? I should have read that last verse a little bit better because it had an exclamation point on it. I'll read it with better emphasis next week as we get into that one, all right? We'll just save that. I just want to save it for next time. Uh, just to kind of catch some of you guys up, if you've been out or this is your first time with us, we have been uh, teaching through the book of Matthew. We are now uh, in uh, chapter 7, which is the, the last chapter of the Sermon on the Mount. And um, it's really been a great time together, digging into God's word, digging into the words of Jesus of this sermon that he's been giving uh, those that were around him and also really to us. We, we, uh, we know that he was speaking to us as well. And last week we ended uh, with reading these verses that I just read, verse 7 and 8 in particular, as hope for those who we know are still without a true relationship with God through Jesus Christ. After hearing and rejecting the gospel, we spent a lot of time talking about that last week. Uh, we talked about canines and pork rinds, right? Yes. And how Jesus said in verse 6 of chapter 7 that we are not to give dogs what is holy and do not give pigs our pearls. Uh, the reason being is that they don't know how to treat those things, right? That's what we discovered and we ended up on the illustration of red and green apples last week and reminded ourselves who the green apples in our lives were, those who are not yet ripe for the gospel or who just outright reject it and don't show any signs of interest in what God has to say. And we also reminded ourselves who might be some red apples in our lives who are ready and ripe for the good news of Jesus Christ and really ready to begin to focus our we, we really began to focus our witnessing and leading uh, to the ways of the Lord on the red apples when it comes to these verses we just read in uh, Matthew it doesn't matter in this section verse 7 and 8 it doesn't matter what color apple you are, or if your life already belongs to Jesus Christ. These verses ring true for every human who has ever been on the planet. Every human who is on the planet now, and every human that will be on the planet in the future. This is the Bible, right? This is the Bible, and it has always been true. It will never stop being true. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. I like, maybe I didn't say that right. Yeah, I don't know. It will never stop being true. Right? right? Yes. We must believe that as followers of God. And, and so because of that, we want to know what it says. We want to know what it says. So today, we're going to look at these verse 7 and 8 together of Matthew chapter 7. So let's look at, back at verse 7. This is what Jesus says. He says, 
these words, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. Now, as we can see, Jesus is taking us back to what is fundamental to any succeeding relationship. And that is communication. Fundamental to any relationship that's going to succeed, and that is communication. He's taking us back to prayer with these verses in 7 and 8. God answers prayer typically three different ways. And you've probably experienced this if you've asked God for anything in your life. God will ask, answer those our requests in three different ways. Yes. No. Wait. Yes, no, and wait. That's how he answers. Now, we already discussed at the end of chapter 6 that God knows exactly what we need. Right? How many of us believe that? Yeah, I mean, his word says it, right? So it's kind of like, yeah, I, 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 again, it has to come from the page to the mind, to the heart, to the action, right? And I think once it gets to the action is when we truly believe, right? God knows what we need. He already knows. So when he answers yes, we have to know that it's for our ultimate good and it's according to his will. When he answers no, we, it must mean that it would ultimately hurt us and it's against his will. And when he says wait, he's just saying we're not ready to receive the answer yet. And this particular passage brings up something else for a lot of people. Because it clearly reads, right? It clearly reads, ask and it will be given to you. This is not, though, a blanket promise with no conditions. As some would like to take it. You know those people that just, they just take, they just plug one verse out of the Bible and they just like, that's it, right? No context, no other kind of nothing, right? This is one of those verses that they like to do that with. They just plug it out. Um, but it's not a blanket promise with no conditions. I mean, you and I can ask for some outrageous things, right? Do you remember as a kid, like, asking for, like, a Lamborghini? <laughs> Somebody like that day yesterday. We talked about it as a kid. <laughs> or just another fancy car. Maybe Lamborghini's not the fancy car. I don't know. Maybe Lamborghini's not the, the thing. I hope you're not asking for a Tesla, but that's a conversation for later. <laughs> um, what about... themselves under the umbrella of Christianity that would teach that. Some people will say yes because they want to treat God like some cosmic genie. It would really benefit us though to, to read the words from Jesus in light of other revelation that we've been given in scripture. To kind of put all these pieces together. One thing is for sure that we must do when we talk to God is ask. We know that some things God's not going to give us unless we ask, right? Some things only come through that, through prayer. When we ask, we are, it's a form of verbal humility. And an awareness 
place of need. It, it communicates really our dependence on God, which we are for everything. James, in the book of James, is, you know, again, he puts something like this very, fairly blunt. He says, you desire, in James chapter 4, verse 2, he says, you desire and do not have, so you murder, you covet, and you cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. And James just simply says, hey, you do not have because you do not ask. So the ask is necessary part of our communication with God. In Ephesians chapter 6 verse 18 Paul writes to the church of Ephesus praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication all things we are to ask God about to bring to him to help and he goes to that end keep alert with all perseverance making supplication for all the saints. This is things that we go to God and we ask for and our Jesus and Paul are directing those kind of asks with some things that they've said. We're going to look at three ways in which we are to ask when we pray to God. First of all, we're to ask in faith. Ask in faith. In Matthew chapter 21 verses 18 through 22 it says, in the, in the morning, as he was returning to the city, he became hungry. He's talking about Jesus. And seeing a fig tree by the wayside, he went to it and found nothing on it but only leaves. And he said to it, may no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, how did the fig tree wither at once? And Jesus answered them, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. So there is a condition to our asking and receiving. And one of those conditions is faith. We must ask in faith. James, again, the book of James, chapter 1, 5 through 8. James says, if any one of you, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, right? Let him ask in faith with, with no doubting. For the one who doubts... It's like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. If he is, double -minded, if he is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So we, so we must ask in faith. That must be, look, the reason why we go to God is because he can do something about it. Right? We've got to believe that in our heart. We have to know that to be true about him. So we must ask in faith. And a couple more verses on that. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6. He, the writer of Hebrews says, And without faith it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Again, part of our, that's part of our faith in asking. He exists. He can do something about it, and he knows what's best for me. That's how I'm going to go. That's how I am approaching. Not that he's going to give me everything that I want. That's not the idea. But the idea is, is that I know he can do whatever he wants to do. He has the ability. And finally, Mark chapter 11, verse 24, Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, Whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. This is not name it and claim it. This is the idea that leads us really to other conditions, right? Because we, we must ask in faith. 
We must believe. Well, the second thing in our ask is that we must ask with right motives. Because if we ask with wrong motives, then God's not going to answer that. Again, the, James chapter 4 tells us, verse 3, You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. So there is a way to ask wrongly, but we must ask. So we must ask in faith. We must ask in the right motives. The third thing we are instructed to do when we go and pray to God with our asks, it says, ask in the name of Jesus. You know, we've grown accustomed to ending our prayers that way to make sure that we've got this covered, right? But I, I really think that it's more than just ending our prayer in Jesus' name. It's praying in line with Jesus' name. Yeah. You know, we, uh, we talk about taking the name, the name of the Lord in vain. And that doesn't really mean cuss words, even though I think it could include them. It doesn't really mean that. It means calling yourself a Christian and not acting like one. That's really taking the Lord's name in vain. And we can do that in our prayers as well when we ask for things in the name of Jesus that don't align with him or his kingdom or his work or his will. In John chapter 14, verses 13 and 14, Jesus says, Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Well, what's the stipulation there? God's what? God's glory, right? God's glory is at stake in that. So that's when Jesus will answer is when it has to do with God's glory uh, in his name. In Matthew uh, chapter 18, verses 15 through 20, you guys are familiar with this passage because this is how we deal with conflict, right? This is how we do that. We've committed to do that with each other here. It says, uh, Matthew 18, verses 15 through 20, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them... Tell it to the church, and if refuses to listen even to the church, let it let him be to you as a Gentile or tax collector. Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. And I'm going to tell you, I don't really think that that means just physically. <laughs> that if two or three together physically, I know that's, that verse is used for that context all the time, but if you read this passage, it means that we are aligned in our thoughts. We're in agreement about something here in Matthew 18 about conflict. And we've come, two or three are gathered in the agreement of Jesus Christ on these things. Guess what? He is with us. We are aligned with his name. And there's been so many times this has been not done correctly in the name of Christ. Finally, uh, in asking in the name of Jesus, John chapter 16, verses 23 through 24, it says, In that day you will ask nothing of me. He's talking about when he's gone. But he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you've asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive that your joy may be full. 
So in our ask, when we ask, because we must ask, we, have to, we need to ask in faith, we need to ask with right motives, and we need to ask in line with the name of Jesus Christ. The second thing that uh, Jesus mentions to us is that we, we, if we ask, we will receive, right? And then he says if we, what? What's the next thing? If we seek, if we seek, it says, and you will find. Now, what is seek? Well, I define seek for us this way. Responsible action that pursues the will of God. Responsible action that pursues the will of God. So if we seek that, we will find it. Proverbs, uh, th again, these are not New Testament ideas, guys. These are not. This is the way it's been with God. Right? This is just the way it's been. Proverbs 8, 17 says, I love those who love me, says the Lord, and those who seek me diligently find me. Find me. There's a, there's a kind of a clarification in that verse, too. What is it? What's the word? Diligent. Diligent. Those who diligently see, do you think that that's a nonchalant word? That's just like, oh yeah, I'm following God, right? No, no, no. Diligently, it takes some time. It takes some effort. In First Chronicles chapter twenty-eight, verse nine. It says, "In you, Solomon, my son, this is King Solomon." David's son, but it says, and you, Solomon, my son, know the God of your father and serve him with a whole heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands every plan and thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. So strong words. <laughs> given to a king, though. You have to understand, if you give it to a king, I, but I think it's true for everybody, right? It is true. If you seek him, you'll find him. If you forsake him, you're lost. Goes on in, uh, later on in the next verse, <laughs> in 1 Chronicles 28, verse 10, he goes on to say, Be careful now, for the Lord has chosen you to build a house for the sanctuary, be strong and do it. Be strong and do it. Thank God, again, maybe speaking to some of us this morning as we're seeking his kingdom. We want to, we want to seek his will. We're seeking all these things and God has stuff for you. So uh, get on the program and do it. Right? And that's seeking him. Isaiah 55, 6 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. This is, uh, this is for our white knucklers out there. Or maybe those who are struggling to move forward with God, what God is asking you to do. <laughs> you better respond while he can be found. You better be seeking while he can be found. You better respond while he's near. It's not always going to be that way. It's not always going to be that way. Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 12 and 13. This, by the way, this is one of those Sundays where we're just really allowing the Bible to teach the Bible, which is my pre preferred way, right? You guys know that. So this is why we have so many passages today. But it's just so important that that takes place here. But Jeremiah 29, 12 and 13 it says there, then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and what? Find me. When you seek me with all your heart. See, a lot of times we, we kind of we end the verse. You seek me, you find me, and that's it, right? We, um, we leave off something very important. When you seek me with all of your heart. It goes back to the world we read while ago, right? That would be diligent. That would be diligently when we seek him with all of our heart. Psalm 34, 10. 
Psalms 34.10 says, The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. So Jesus, yes, Jesus is laying out like this way of praying, but look what the way he's laying out of praying, look what it leads to. It leads to God being good for us finding what we seek. We find it these things and we lack no good thing from the Lord. Again, Psalm 105 4 it says this, seek the Lord in his strength seek his presence what? Continually when does that stop? <laughs> never never, it never stops it's a continuous thing to be always uh, seeking the Lord in his strength, right? His, how strong is God? Yeah, right? The answer is strong enough. <laughs> For what, whatever you can come up with, he's strong enough. Oh, Psalms 119, 1 through 5, it says, Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart. See, see, now we're getting some clarification of what does that mean? Well, it means obeying. It means that I, I, I am striving to be blameless. I, I am keeping up with the word of God. I am seeking him with my whole heart. And he says, he goes on to say, who also do no wrong, but walk in his ways. And you have, co uh, you have commanded your precepts to be kept Diligently, oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. You mean in my relationship with God, it is best for me to obey him? Is that what this means? Yes. That's part of seeking God. You're seeking God when you walk in his ways. Because guess what? That's where he's found. He's found in that. In the, way, in the things that he has set up. You know, we just read a few weeks ago, back in uh, chapter 6 of, of Matthew, we we're going through that. We read this verse, but seek first the, seek when? Sorry. First, seek first the kingdom of God and his what? Righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. So again, just some, now, we, we mustn't mistake this for God's, like, conditions for his love, right? Because he loved, these aren't conditions for his love. These are conditions for when we are praying and asking things from him in the way that we should. And, and we're given the answers of how to find him. Because Jesus said, you'll seek, you'll find. Well, okay, well, I, how, I want to know how to seek. Right? What, what, are, what are the things for that? And then the Bible, it's already, it's already told us in the Old Testament. He tells us some more in the New Testament about how to do that. And so back in chapter 6, verse 33, how do we seek the kingdom first? Well, we seek God and his righteousness. And then all these things. Seeking God's kingdoms means... Putting God's plan before our own. We're on his agenda, not our own. We're seeking God's righteousness means we means it, setting a priority on personal holiness and desiring sanctification in our lives. That's how we seek his righteousness. In John chapter 15, Jesus says these words, If you abide in me, and my word abides in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. He's saying, hey, stay in relationship with me. Uh, keep allowing me to work in your life. Right? You keep following me, I'll keep putting it to you. While you're doing that, you ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. John chapter 15, verse 16. Later on in that 
same chapter. Jesus says these words, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your father, sorry, and, and that, <laughs> that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. So when are, when are we going to do that? When are we going to be seeking God's kingdom first and seeking him when, when we are bearing fruit? Through Jesus Christ. Is this too much? A couple more verses here on seek. A couple more verses. 1 John chapter 3, 21 through 23. John says here, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from Him. Do you know how our heart doesn't condemn us? We don't have unconfessed sin in our life. That's how our heart doesn't condemn us. But if our heart, if we know that we have that, then this is not true for us. But beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, that means we don't have any unconfessed sin in our life, that we're repenting of those sins, then we have confidence before God and whatever we ask we receive from Him because we keep His commandments and do what pleases Him. And this is the commandment that we believe in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as He commanded us to do. That's how we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And the last one here on the seek, 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. John writes this at the, at the end of 1 John. He says, and this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked him. I, this is how we ask, this is how we know when we're asking for his will is when we are aligned with his will. I mean, that's what these verses are saying. And that does not come apart from obedience. Mm -hmm. It doesn't come without that. It comes with that. I, we're not talking about perfection. And you guys know me well enough. We've, we've, we've had those discussions. You guys know me well enough. That we're not talking about perfection. But what we're talking about is action. That I'm, I, yeah, I'm, I'm shooting the arrow. Like I'm trying. Like I'm moving this direction. I'm, I am seeking God with all I have. I'm trying to follow him. I, I'm linking arms with my brothers and sisters. And we're trying to do this thing together as a church. But it's not about perfection. The only way we reach perfection is when we're off of this planet. And in the presence of the Lord. Then we would be like him. But until then, we're trying to be like him, right? I mean, if we're not trying to be like him, then what's the Christian life? I don't understand. I'm very confused. It's in a get out of jail free card? Is it I said this prayer so now I'll never lose my salvation? Is that what that, is that what it means? The, the Christian life? No. It's I'm seeking the kingdom first. And his righteousness first. And when I'm doing that, guess what? God's glory is at stake and he answers us. For his name's sake. That's what the scriptures are telling us. The last thing we have here is the word knock. Which, by the way, I titled this message, Knock Knock. <laughs> um, so, I don't know, some of you guys remember, some of you guys were here when Cole was little, right? How many of you guys got to experience my son Cole, his knock-knock jokes? Right, anybody? No? There's just a few of us? So, my son Cole, like, we would teach him, like, to, to, to say knock-knock jokes, right? And, and, and so, instead of coming to, 
So in teaching him, we would say, say not not, right? And so he said, you know, because so, he's supposed to say not not to get the joke started. Right? That's how not not joke starts, right? All right? Not not. Yeah. Okay, you see, that's how, that's how not not joke starts. But Cole, when he would come and tell a not not joke, he would go to the person and go, say not not. Because we would tell him to say not, we would say those words to him while trying to teach him, so he'd go and say, say not not. And it took people a long time to go, instead of saying not not, I'm supposed to say who's there. So, anyway, that's the way he would tell not knock jokes. And so the idea when we go to God is we're not supposed to say, say not knock. When we go to God, we're supposed to go, knock, knock. And he'll say, well, who's there, right? And I know that you and I use that in our social lives as a, as a, as a form of joking and telling jokes. But Jesus here offers us this idea of knocking to teach us persistence. It's to teach us persistence. And my son was pretty persistent with his say not not jokes. But it's, but it's to teach us persistence and this idea. So again, in our, when Jesus is telling us this, he's, he's like telling you, hey, you know, again, I, I say this, I, I, I seem to be saying this a lot going through the Sermon on the Mount, that I, you guys know that I'm very against formulas unless the Bible gives us a formula. Right? And I think Jesus here, he's just telling us, he's giving us, hey, ask, seek, knock. Ask, seek, knock. He's giving us this idea of what God does. And um, in Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 5, it says this and there. It says, and, and he, being Jesus, told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. So what does this parable mean to us? That we should what? Always pray and not lose heart. Don't give up. Tony Evans says, uh, keep, keep praying until you get an answer. Right? So when you should stop praying when you get an answer. That's when you should stop. There's this idea of persistence that we can continue to go and go and go. Uh, that's this idea of knocking. Uh, but he said, uh, Luke, back, back to Luke 18, 1 through 5, and he told him this parable to the effect that they ought to always pray and not lose heart. And he said this, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. You say a bad guy, right? Yeah. That's, a, that's a dangerous guy. And, and there was a widow in the city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. And for a while he refused. But after... But afterwards he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice, so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. <laughs> like, again. But how good is God? So yeah, so... When we go to him in persistence, like, again, he knows what we need. He loves us. He knows what's best for us. He just wants us to understand what's best for us. And obviously talking to him often about many things is best for us. Verse 8, Matthew chapter 7. It just simply it simply just puts verse seven in different words. It says, "For everyone who seeks, sorry, for everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks it will be opened." Now, I um, I wanted to kind of wrap up today's sermon with this quote. From gotquestions.org that'll just really give us a good summary of today. And I just want to, to to read that to you. It says this. You can read it on the screen with me. It says, Jesus is not saying that believers always get what they ask for. Wrong motives, for example, which we covered, will hinder answers to prayer. However, the, the more time a Christian spends in communication with God, 
the more he or she will know what to ask for in accordance with God's will. Prayer in and of itself does not produce sanctification, which is an increasing holiness in a believer's life. But it does show a dependence on God for the needs that can be met no other way. God is always pleased with such displays of faith. It is only faith in what God can do and what Christ has done that brings about true sanctification, not an artificial self-righteousness. So we are humbly to go before God in the way that he asks us to come before him. These verses <clears throat> make it abundantly clear that God answers those who pursue him. Every, everyone who asks receives, who seeks finds, and who knocks, the door will be open. And that is great news for us when we go after God in these ways. But before we go today, I, I, I couldn't let this go. I, I would like us to consider, now that we know how God will respond, I would like to consider how you and I respond to God when he does these things to us. When God asks us, when he seeks us, when he knocks, how do we answer him? Earlier, I told you that God answers us in three different ways. Yes, no, and wait. And I'm just wondering how many of us in here, God has told us to do something, or he's seeking us out for a purpose, or he's just been knocking at our door and we have said no or we've said wait I'm wondering how many of us in here God has told us to do something and for whatever reason We just haven't responded at all. If we if we if we responded with no or wait, if we've answered God that way, maybe it's because we think we know better than God does about our ultimate good and His will for our lives. Or we answer that way, maybe what out of fear. Answer that way out of fear. If you're only going to remember one thing that I have ever said to you, remember this one. Tell God yes. When he asks, yes. When he seeks, yes. When he knocks, yes, come in. Come in. To one of the churches in Revelation, Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, Jesus says this word to that church, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him, and he with me. That verse is used a lot when calling sinners or people to come into a first-time relationship with Jesus Christ. But I don't think it's just for that. You see, Jesus was talking to a church in Revelation chapter 3. So that part of the relationship had probably already occurred. The issue was that Jesus had been <laughs> trying to get the church's attention and 
Nobody was answering the door, but he just promises this. If you would just answer the door, I will come in and we will have fellowship with one another. So again, if that's you, God's been, Jesus has been knocking on your heart. God's been knocking on your heart. God's been asking you to do something and you're stuck. I, I would just like us to spend this time right now exploring that. Some of you, when I said those things, you knew immediately what it was. You knew immediately. But some of you guys may have not, maybe you hadn't even been thinking about this before today. And so maybe you need just to spend a few moments seeking God about this. Hey, God. Have you been asking me to do something? We're promised when we do that, he, he answers us. He answers things like that. So I'd just like us, just for right now, just to spend just a few moments having that conversation with God before we close. Okay, let's do that now.